Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to The Long Read from Stuff. This week's story is called The Heist. It was written by Marlborough Express reporter Chloe Ranford in 2019, and Chloe has since left the Marlborough Express. So joining me now is the newspaper's editor, Ian Allen. Hi, Ian. Hi, Michael. Uh, so The Heist, the, the title is uh, tantalisingly brief. Set the story up for us. What was The Heist? Oh, well, the heist is basically what happens when boozed-up bravado goes wrong or, depending on how you look at it, goes incredibly right for a while. Um, Basically, it was a couple of drinking buddies that uh, thought they could pull off a bank job and, well, they were right um, and all they really needed was a blowtorch. So we'll hear all about the heist in a minute, but just give us the bare bones of, of the story. Um, what did they hit and what did they get? Yeah, uh, reading the story, I just can't help but picture uh, that image of a bank robbery in a cartoon. You know, that we've got these guys and we've got a blowtorch and they essentially just cut their way through a big, massive, thick steel door climb through, find all this money that was there over the long Easter weekend and make off with notes sticking out of old Gladstone bags and things like that. And then it became like the biggest news event, certainly in Blenheim of the decade. And this happened uh, some time ago. The story is three years old now, but the story of the heist is decades old. So where and when exactly did this all happen? Yeah, so this was 1960s Blenheim, um, before everyone got rich off grapes. The first commercial grapes weren't planted until the 70s, the early 70s. So Blenheim was, like much of New Zealand, farming, agricultural um, all the sheep and beef farmers were still there. Um, Ray Hancock, or protagonist, I guess you could call him, said Blenheim was pretty boring. But the town, you know, it had late night shopping on a Friday night, and the pubs had actually just started staying open till ten o'clock, and maybe that was Ray's downfall. Um, if he had kept going home at six o'clock, then maybe the heist might have never happened. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Now, here is Adam Dudding reading Chloe Ranford's story, The Heist. Are you ready? Ready? Ready for what? The Heist. Ray Hancock had just been woken by his long-time drinking buddy and friend, Jeff Sargent. The perfect bank job was something the pair had talked about in the pub with mates. They loved to plot ways to break the shackles of boredom and low pay in 1960s small-town New Zealand. But here, in the middle of an April night in 1968, was the dare to make it real. With Sergeant standing over him, Hancock was being asked to put his money where his mouth was. Make me a cup of coffee while I get dressed, Hancock replied. Hancock was a strongly built man with blonde, curly hair. In March 1968, aged 29, he was an engineer at Simonson's Brothers, a commercial piggery just outside Blenheim. He'd been working there for two years. He had nothing but a parking ticket to his name. He liked to drink at the end of the week with his mates, including the then 23-year-old sergeant. They'd been friends for more than five years. Blenheim pubs were given permission to serve drinks until 10pm, just five months earlier, after closing at 6pm for 50 years. After a few late-night drinks, the friends would often delve into a discussion about money. Marlborough was a low-income area, and most people were strapped for cash. Unemployment was a part of life. An average three-bedroom house cost $8,280 now about $142,000, having risen 24.2% in eight years. Hancock recalled the 1960s being dead boring for everyone around, as nothing was happening and everyone was going nowhere. Farmers had yet to cash in on the grape rush. The first commercial vineyard 
wasn't planted until 1973. Topics of interest in the latter half of the decade included the introduction of miniskirts, the changing length of boys' hair at Marlborough Boys College, and Blenheim being confused with Nelson three times on television. In the 60s, you went to work, you went home, went to the pub, moaned into your beer, Hancock said. It went round and round. No one went anywhere. It was a town behind the times and a country behind the times. One night at the pub, Hancock and his friends got onto the topic of escaped prisoner Trevor Nash, who was the central figure in a £19,000 payroll robbery in Auckland in 1956. Nash and his gang broke into the Waterfront Industries Commission's offices before they were arrested, escaped and then arrested again in Australia. Hancock was critical of how Nash executed his crime and said he hadn't been smart about it. You haven't got the guts to do what Nash did, Sergeant said. Bloody oath I could too, Hancock said. The circle of friends joked that robbing a bank would be the only way to get out of debt. It was a fun idea, one that was easy enough to entertain during their regular pub sessions. On paper, the group decided, they had the perfect team. Sergeant once worked in the Blenheim Post Office, which connected to the Post Office Savings Bank, one of the few buildings in town that stored a large pile of cash. He was familiar with the saving bank's layout and knew how someone could enter the building and steal the money in the strong room without setting off the alarm. Hancock, on the other hand, knew how to use a blowtorch, which could be used to get through the strong room's door. The group decided there would be little problem getting into the saving bank's strong room, The door only boasted two thick plates. It shouldn't be a problem, providing, of course, the alarm system could be bypassed. Their theory was based on a 1935 incident when the same strong room door had to be cut with a blowtorch after its key jammed. Both Hancock and Sargent guessed the savings bank would have replaced it with the same type of door. Hancock, a self-described smart bastard who could do everything, thought the savings bank heist would be an easy, in-out job. According to Hancock, Sargent was a pretty laid-back but private man who thought it would be a laugh. But surely this was just pup talk, a fantastical tale spun by a bunch of buddies to pass the hours. Until it wasn't. On April the 15th, 1968, an Easter Monday, the men decided to rob the savings bank. The two left in Hancock's small dark green Chevrolet truck and drove to Sergeant's house. There, Sergeant grabbed a small crowbar, a screwdriver, pliers and a box of tools. Next stop was Hancock's workplace to pick up a blowtorch. Like most farms in the 60s, the piggeries' barns and sheds were never locked. When they got to the savings bank in the centre of Blenheim, they parked in the yard next door and went around the back. They tried to force a window with the crowbar, but it didn't work. They were worried smashing the glass might draw attention to them, so they turned their attention to the rear door. Later, a police report would say the pair forced it with the crowbar, but Hancock said he just used his shoulder. Regardless, the door gave, and the two gained entry to the savings bank section of the post office. They did some quick repairs to the door so it could be locked again, then moved to the strong room door, just a few feet away. It was painted a dull green and locked by a key. It had metal plate inside, a half-inch steel plate outside, and an alarm over its lock. The electric alarm system was the tricky part, Hancock recalled. It was motion and heat sensored. If it went off, it would have alerted the police at the station, and we wouldn't know if we'd tripped it until it was too late. But the blowtorch should, in theory, cut a hole in the door without triggering the alarm over the lock. The pair propped open a window in case they needed a quick getaway and pulled the blinds. Hancock then cut a hole about 20 inches by 16 inches into the outer plate of the door while Sergeant kept watch. The back room had big high windows that looked out onto a narrow road between the savings bank and the old Marlborough Club Hotel. Hancock and Sergeant worried bright flashes and sparks from the welding would catch someone's eye. Hancock worried the police would appear at any moment, but no one came. Next, Hancock cut a smaller hole in an inner plate 
giving an opening large enough for the two to climb through. All up, the cutting took about half an hour. The two crawled through the hole and into the strong room where they found post office cash, postal notes, stamps and more cash from the social security department. The strong room had four wooden lockers, four steel lockers and several steel cabinets. Sergeant pointed out the lockers that contained cash. They prized them open and found $21,000 in crisp banknotes. Then Hancock noticed a Gladstone bag, a kind of supersized leather briefcase. Jeff said to forget about them, Hancock said, but I was curious about the bag, so I had a poke around and found it had this toy lock on it. I broke the lock and found the bag had $30,000 inside. We later found out it was a social welfare payout from the Social Security Department that was left at the post office and wasn't supposed to be there. It was the long Easter weekend. The department's Social Security funds believed to total $30,000, the equivalent of more than half a million dollars today, were locked away for safekeeping. The two men put all their takings in the Gladstone bag and took the lot. There was so much money, some of it was sticking out the top. They packed the bag, the blowtorch and the tools into the car. They left nothing but some grit and steel cuttings, half a dozen burnt matches and the hole in the strong room door. Hancock and Sergeant both wore gloves and burned the clothes they'd been wearing with the blowtorch. After returning the blowtorch to the workshop, the pair drove to Hancock's house and made a rough count of the cash. They weren't sure how much they'd taken. Hancock buried a wad of cash under his dog kennel. The pair then packed the rest of the money into polythene bags, placed the bags into the Gladstone bag and, carrying rifles to make it look like they were going shooting, drove about 65 kilometres deep into the Marlborough Sounds bush. The pair trekked to a remote spot, dug a hole with the jungle knife, and buried the Gladstone bag. Hancock and Sergeant agreed that if they got caught, neither would give up where the money was hidden. According to a Marlborough Express article, the following morning, April 16, Savings Bank custodian Mr W. Steele arrived at work as usual. He found the main back door to the yard open, but didn't immediately notice the hole in the strong room door. But eventually police were called, and word of the burglary soon spread through Blenheim and New Zealand. Alan Diamanti was 21 years old and working as a post office teller. First he heard of the burglary was when he turned up to work. He was running late. A policeman intercepted him as he arrived, told him there had been a burglary, and directed him through the post office's front entrance, which was used by the public. We did have to open that day, Diamanti said. There wasn't any closing down. But behind the calm facade, there was a flurry of activity. Blenheim's two-man criminal investigation branch, Detective Eric McLaughlin and Detective Constable Bert Sinclair, was about to be bolstered by detectives from Christchurch, Nelson and Wellington. From Christchurch came Detective Sergeant G.T. Dawson and Detective T.J. Gorman. Fingerprint expert Detective B. Gunderson came from Wellington, and from Nelson, Detective Sergeant A. W. Hedwig, who took over the case from McLaughlin. Shortly after 1pm, the manager of the savings bank, G. D. H. Green, turned the key in the strong room door and opened it for the first time in the presence of police. Their worst fears were confirmed. Thousands of dollars were missing. It was something like what you'd see out of an old movie, Diamante said. The door was a solid old iron thing, painted deep green, and it had a key in it about two hand spans long. The strong room itself was very low, it would hardly be seven feet tall. The door to the strong room would be an age old, Diamante said. To modern welding equipment, even in the 60s, it would be like a hot knife going through butter. Gunderson was the first to step into the room, in the hope of recovering some fingerprints. Nelson police photographer Constable C.R. Barron followed, taking pictures, before Hedwig entered with Green. An audit showed $24,341.50 was missing from the New Zealand Post Office, along with $26,630.42 from the Social Security Department for a total haul of $50,971.92. More than $900,000 today. Police said at the time 
The heist trumped Trevor Nash's £19,000 effort, the crime that had sparked Hancock and Sergeant's daring escapade. The police commissioner at the time, G.C. Urquhart, said the heist was probably the biggest in New Zealand's history. They tried not to have too much money overnight, Diamante said, but Friday night used to be late night shopping and the bank would stay open until 8pm. You'd have to step off the footpath to walk past Thomas's shopping mall on a Friday in those days. The whole town would be chocker. Police told media it appeared the burglars knew what they were doing. They had probably surveyed the bank beforehand or had inside knowledge of its layout and picked their moment carefully. The strong room had been broken into on April 15 and Easter Monday when it was holding a lot more cash than usual. Over the next few days, police checked the alibis of every known criminal in New Zealand capable of breaking into the savings bank, but found that none of them had been in Blenheim over Easter. They also ran checks on all past and present employees of the Blenheim Post Office and the Social Security Department, who would have known intimate details of the savings bank. No one caught their eye. A broken window from the savings bank was removed to check for fingerprints after none were found in the strong room. It revealed nothing. Two days later, the empty cash boxes and strong room door were taken to Wellington for further examination. It was another dead end. On April 18, three days after the heist, businesses belonging to the Marlborough Chamber of Commerce got together to discuss the burglary. One member accused the post office of being exceedingly lax in its security arrangements. Bank of New Zealand Blenheim manager J.R. Dickens expressed his dismay at the savings bank's security. His own bank was equipped with an anti-blow safe behind a combination safe. That's where the cash is kept, Dickens said, not in wooden boxes. Blenheim-based inspector A. Hunt reassured members that the culprits would not be on the run for long. There is a man or a group of people who have set a record for New Zealand that they won't be able to skite about, he said. There was a lot of things like that where you'd think, what the f***? From Stuff, a new 12-part documentary podcast. He was into sex every day. The Commune. Sex, drugs, and a guru called Bert. There are crimes, but this isn't a who done it. It's a why done it. Good God, adults agreed to this? The Commune. Find it now on your favourite podcast platform or at stuff.co.nz slash the commune. You've already been welcome to Centre Point. As police searched far and wide for the missing money, Ray Hancock was using it to pay his bills. In the post office, he had just robbed. He settled his overdue phone bill and paid his girlfriend's car insurance. The notes were crisp and clean, so he crinkled them and rubbed them in dirt to make them look used. Despite the consecutive identification numbers on the notes, nobody noticed. Hancock even inquired how the investigation was going, A staff member told him the hole in the door was the sweetest they'd ever seen. But despite Hancock's bravado, not everyone was as oblivious as he thought. The piggery Hancock worked for, Simonson Brothers, was co-owned by brothers Lloyd, Ross and Bobby Simonson. Ross Simonson said it took the brothers just a few days to suspect their polite, clean and tidy employee Hancock. It was a description of the crime scene in the Marlborough Express that tipped them off. It was the way he welded stuff, Ross Simonson says today, from his home in Witherley in Blenheim. The way he dropped his matches. But we didn't confront him. We weren't sure. And you've always got to give people the benefit of the doubt. Besides, he was a good worker and we didn't want to lose him. Good workers are hard to come by. It was hard to fill vacancies then. Simonson said Hancock was a brilliant engineer, He built trailers, a grain system for the piggery, and a stock car, which Simonson would drive. He could build anything from nothing, Simonson said. He was just a happy-go-lucky guy, not a care in the world. On April 19, four days after the heist, Hancock went to burn the floor mats of his small truck in case he had walked dust and dirt from the crime scene into his car. But when he turned up the rubbish pile where he'd left them, the mats were gone. Hancock recalls today, the police had come down to check the gas plant out, which they were doing all over Marlborough with all gas plants. 
When I got down there, the police had already been in, and I thought, oh, Jesus. And I said to Lloyd Simonson, I said, the police down there, did they take those floor mats? Lloyd, a close friend, told Hancock that he had taken them out and burnt them. He had a wife and kids, Hancock says, and I didn't want to get him in trouble. So I told him about carrying out the heist. He collapsed on the ground. He couldn't handle it. It was then that Hancock called the police and turned himself in. I rang them up, told them I'd done it, Hancock says. They didn't believe me. They said, this is you and the warped sense of humour that you've got, because I had quite a bit of a reputation. After about three hours, they told me they were going to book me for hindering a police investigation. And one of them said, no, he knows too much. That was Dawson, the second in command. Hancock didn't consult his friend and heist partner, Jeff Sargent, before turning himself in. I went at it alone, he says. Jeff was way out in the field, working with land and survey, and we had already agreed if something came unstuck, we would go in on our own. But he wouldn't let me. Later that night, Hancock and Sergeant were arrested. They admitted their crime. They were charged with breaking and entering a building with intent to commit a crime. The next morning, the pair led detectives to the area in the Maho Sound, part of the Marlborough Sounds, where they'd buried the Gladstone bag. It took a few hours of searching and rough scrub before they found the hiding place. Despite being packed in canvas and plastic bags, the cash was soaking wet. The money was taken to the Blenheim police station where the notes were dried out. Hancock and Sergeant weren't so lucky. The pair were taken in their wet, mud-spattered clothes to the Blenheim court and remanded to appear before the Blenheim magistrate court on April the 26th. A news report of the hearing said Hancock kept smiling as the charge was read. The pair were taken into custody until their next appearance. Hancock was wearing a light blue football jersey with the number 20 on it. A photographer got a photo of me with my central jersey number on the back, Hancock says, which was a bit deflating for me because I was the full-time centre or wing. I wasn't a reserve, but that was the reserve number. Meanwhile, Police and bank and social security department staff tallied the cash. They found $46,722.61 in the Gladstone bag, which left $4,249.31 unaccounted for. The missing money claims were rubbish, Hancock says. Neither the police nor the bank tellers were really sure how much was there to begin with. The whole damn show was wide open. There was money loose everywhere. Anyone could have seen what had happened picked up a wad of cash to stick it in their pocket. A small army of police searched the ridge between Maho and Kinapuru Sounds in hopes of finding the missing money. They even considered emptying the grain out of the hundred-ton silos at Hancock's work. No more cash was ever found. Hancock and Sargent pleaded guilty in the Blenheim Magistrates Court on April the 30th, almost two weeks after the heist. The pair weren't charged with bank robbery, because that implied intimidation was used. They also weren't charged with theft, as they had, for the most part, returned the money. The hearing attracted a lot of spectators. For the first time in years, it was standing room only in the court's public gallery. Alec MacDonald, Hancock's former teacher and rugby coach at St Patrick's College in Upper Hutt, provided a letter supporting his former pupil. We, who knew him in the school, MacDonald wrote, find it hard to associate him with so serious a crime. He was a happy schoolboy, more interested in sports and books, and in minor scrapes at most, but there was never a hint of anything serious, and certainly nothing against his honesty through his time at college. On May the 17th, the pair appeared in the Supreme Court for sentencing. Today, Hancock says the whole thing was a light-hearted affair, until Judge Wilson got involved. Several years before the heist, in 1963, the Great Train Robbery had captivated Britain. One of the robbers, Ronnie Biggs, was caught and sentenced and later escaped from Wandsworth Prison in London. He continued to elude authorities by travelling the world. In the process, he became something of a cult figure, inspiring television dramas, newspaper cartoons and even a wax statue at Madame Tussauds. Judge Wilson was paranoid 
that Hancock and Sargent would get the same public sympathy. Before they were caught, local newspapers had run cartoons poking fun at the Blenheim post office heist and depicting the pair living the high life overseas. The judge was incensed by the cartoons, Hancock says. He got septic, yelled about how much we were like bigs. It was bigs this, bigs that, to the point where I asked the cop with me if I was at the right hearing because there was just so much talk about bigs. The judge got furious at that. He jumped over a stand and looked just about ready to hang me. Judge Wilson sentenced the pair to three years in jail, saying it was one of the saddest cases he had seen. Neither of you had any real need of money. Neither of you had done anything dishonest before in your lives, so far as one can make out. And I do not think either of you will ever do a dishonest thing again. And yet, there was some basic defect in your ethical makeup because you deliberately settled down and planned a burglary for the purposes of stealing money from the post office savings bank. Hancock and Sargent served their three-year sentences in Addington Prison, Christchurch Men's Prison, Rolleston Prison, and Mount Crawford Prison. We went to bloody near every prison in the country, Hancock says. I'd never seen so much of New Zealand. Each time they arrived somewhere new, their reputation for pulling off one of the biggest heists in New Zealand made them the bosses. The Lower Downs had to make an appointment if they wanted to see us, Hancock says. People thought I was New Zealand's answer to Ned Kelly. Sergeant served two years and three months before being released. Hancock served a month longer. Looking back, he says, I would tell my younger self not to tell the police and don't give back the money. It would have brought about ten houses back in the day. The police said we should never have given it back. The legal profession said we should never have given it back. They brought a priest that came round to see me. He said we should never have given it back. But despite having, quote, no guilt, no shame, no regrets, unquote, about the heist, Hancock couldn't do it now. The ATMs take all the skill out of it, he says. Down at his local pub in Picton, Oxley's bar and kitchen duty manager, Lauren Cunningham, says Hancock was definitely a character. He had a favourite spot at the end of the bar where he'd lean himself against the wall and have a drink. Now 80 years old, Hancock signs his name... What's left of Ray Hancock? It's a nod to his frail legs, his suspected methyl bromide poisoning, and being blind in one eye. He does enjoy his notoriety, Cunningham says. I didn't believe him the first time he told me about the burglary. He compares himself to a train robber and old American bank robbers. He tells other customers all about his adventures. Hancock recalls a time when he told one woman at the pub and she didn't believe him. She came up to him later and laughed. You really are a bank robber, she said. I thought you were a load of shit. That was The Heist on the Long Read from Stuff, written by Chloe Ranford, read by Adam Dudding and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was edited by Jack Price. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listen via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on the Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening.